All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Um, for those I have not had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is Kate Fritz and I have the honor of serving as the CEO of the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. Thanks for joining us this morning for our Breakfast on the Bay speaker series this summer. Um, this morning, we're going to be talking about trees and learning a lot more about how to identify trees and some neat naturalist facts. So um, the Alliance is celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. Um, for the last 50 years, the organization has brought together communities, companies, and conservationists to restore the lands and waters of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. The Alliance does our work across four different program areas, including agriculture, forests, green infrastructure, and stewardship and engagement. We work across the entirety of the 64,000 square mile Chesapeake Bay watershed with an, our headquarters in Annapolis, Maryland, an office in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Washington, DC, and in Richmond, Virginia. As an organization, we value three things highly. We value collaboration. We believe in partnering across sectors and regions to achieve a larger collective impact. The second value we hold is inclusivity. We've, we are partners who demonstrate integrity and amplify diverse voices for an equitable impact. And our third value as an organization is driving with results. We drive with data, we promote informed action, and we hold ourselves and our partners accountable for measurable impact. So in celebration of our 50th anniversary, we are bringing 50 stories to life this year. Each story features individuals, projects, ideas, places, and partnerships representing five decades of restored lands and waters of the Chesapeake Bay. We, uh, Lauren Souter just put a link to our 50 Stories initiative in the chat where you can um, check out the work we have been doing over the last 50 years. So if you're joining us on Zoom, uh, we are in a webinar, so um, you will stay muted, um, but we encourage you to type your questions into the chat. We will pause and ask Ryan to answer those questions as we go throughout um, the tree talk. So please put them in the chat. And if you're joining us on Facebook, you can include your questions in the chat as well and we'll make sure they get to Ryan. So lastly, thanks to our donors who have made today's presentation possible. Um, our 50 years of on the ground work would not be possible without generous don donors like all of you. And in honor of our 50th anniversary, our generous board members and donors have provided a $25,000 match uh, for any donation made to the Alliance this summer. And we'll pop a, a donation link into the chat if you are interested in providing a donation to help the Alliance continue to uh, focus on the Chesapeake Bay and bringing cleaner water across the Chesapeake Bay. Thank you in advance for any donations. So without further ado, I'm excited to introduce Ryan Davis, who is our forest program manager in Pennsylvania. He is out on site in York County in Pennsylvania this morning to do a tree talk and help identify trees and help us learn more about trees. And his uh, videographer today is our communications director, Adam Miller. Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Ryan and Adam. Nope. <laughs> I guess we're having technical difficulties in the field. I guess we just lost them. I know they will be back on in just a second. Lauren, um, could you potentially um, queue up some Tree Talk videos um, if we're unable to get Adam and Ryan back on? And we can share those videos um, if we're unable to keep the live feed here today. So we've got lots of folks joining us from all over the watershed. Uh, we've got Washington, D.C., Warrington, Virginia, Coles Point, Virginia, Chesterfield, Virginia, Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, welcome all of you from all over the watershed. So those just joining us, we're experiencing a little bit of technical difficulties as part of the challenge of having live events in the field. Um, but we'll, we'll see if Adam and Ryan can join us here. Uh, live again. We we'll hope their data and their connection keep us connected, but uh, we're going to tee up some um, tree talk videos um, to play if we don't get them back, but it looks like they're reconnecting here. So just give us a second 
you know, uh, I think we've all learned a lot about technology over the last year and a half. So um, no virtual event would be a true virtual event without some kind of technical challenge. So Adam and Ryan, are you back on? Yeah, if you can just enable our video. I cannot, but Warren can. Um, these uh, to answer the question in the chat, we will be we are recording this session and we will be circulating it out to everybody who's registered. So, all right, we I see Adam and Ryan are live. So, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you both. Yeah, just one second while we get our camera flipped around here. All right. Okay. We good? <laughs> yeah, we are good. Uh, yeah. So there we go. Uh, hey, folks. Ryan Davis. I am our Pennsylvania Forest Projects Manager for the Alliance for Chesapeake Bay. Um, so what a great example of why shade is important, right? So we're out here, uh, yeah, Adam's phone started overheating. We're standing out in the sun. You know, it's only 10 o'clock. It's not hot yet relative to how it's gonna get, but you know, here we are. So where we are, uh, one of the reasons why, you know, it may be a little bit difficult for the technology here, but this is such a cool site. We think it'll be worth it for us to be here. Uh, we're in Southern York County. Uh, you can probably see behind me all the tree shelters. So this is a riparian forest buffer site that we uh, planted in fall of 2020. Um, so this is actually its first growing season. And as you can see, we already have trees coming out of the shelter. So pretty great. Um, uh, in addition to the fact that we just planted a riparian forest buffer here, there are some super, super cool and unique riparian tree species here. So figured we'd take a look at those, do the whole thing, talk about trees. Um, definitely feel free to put any questions in the chat uh, and we'll take it from there. So um, yeah, again, I'm our forest projects manager. Uh, what do we do on the forest team? We're kind of all about increasing the quantity of forest cover in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So reforestation, uh, the quality of forest cover in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So that's forest management. We have some pretty cool projects where we're helping private forest landowners to manage their woods more sustainably. Uh, and then the third is to increase the awareness about forests and their benefits. There are many, many benefits to us as people and to as our entire ecosystems. Um, so on that note, again, uh, reforestation areas, uh, this one right behind me, um, one of the top things we are doing when we're planting these is actually just putting up shade. Um, the reason why, uh, well, one of the many reasons why these are valuable around streams is because we are decreasing the temperature in the water. Um, we're providing shade on that water uh, so that the fish that live in there stay nice and cool throughout the summer months. Um, these species here in the kind of mid-Atlantic area, they all evolved with forested conditions over their streams. Anything that lives in a stream is very accustomed to shade conditions, uh, woody debris falling into streams, leaves falling into the streams, things like that. A pretty stabilized bank, stream bank, where there's going to be some erosion. There's always erosion. It's a very natural process, but there's also deposition and there's a little bit of a give and take. There's uh, the, the water in the stream is interacting with the land. Um, and all of these things combined make riparian areas, uh, bottomland forests, super, super valuable, unique, ecologic. Really awesome that we have funding to restore uh, in order to improve water quality, but they are really, really beneficial, unique, critical ecosystems in their own right. So it's really great that we get to, you know, be able to restore them. Um, so enough about that. Let's talk about trees. You're all here to talk about trees uh, today or to, to hear me talk about trees. So one of the reasons why I was thinking this would be a really cool spot is because there is a tree species here um, that I very rarely see anywhere else, especially in the wild. Um, so you may have heard of butternut. Um, it is closely related to uh, black walnut, um, which is a very common tree, uh, 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 usually likes kind of moist bottomland sort of soils, the black walnut, but it'll grow pretty much anywhere. Um, closely related uh, uh, in the same genus, juglans, um, is this juglans scenario. So white walnut or butternut. Now we're going to look at black walnut. We have tons of black walnut down here as well. Um, but one of the first things that stands out here uh, is actually the bark of this tree. Um, so when you're doing tree identification, you know, a lot of folks start out really focusing on leaves. Um, we're definitely going to talk a lot about leaves here today, but I kind of like to, you know, you should really look at everything. Uh, if, if leaves are what it takes you to be able to identify it, that's awesome. But then the next step is you should look at the buds. You should look at the bark. You should look at other signs around it so that when you see that in the future, you don't even have to look at the leaves, which is important because here 
at least in PA, you know, definitely a little bit different, different parts of the watershed, but um, we only have leaves on like maybe half the year, you know, it, it's winter time or the leaves are falling or they're, you know, budding out, you know, about six months out of the year. So it's really important for us to be able to know the bark here. Um, if you're doing any forest management, unless you just want to restrict it to the hottest, most humid, nastiest time of year uh, in the summer. Um, so uh, about this bark, one of the, the, the kind of tools and, and, and tricks that it takes you to kind of get good at tree identification is not necessarily kind of learning all this stuff, but just kind of learning how to pay attention, what to look at, what to focus on. So let's look at this bark. And I feel that kind of describing the bark is a good way to like, you know, start to pay attention to it. So it's very gray in color. Um, Juglin cenaria, again, uh, cenaria means gray, ashy gray. Uh, it's ash colored, I believe, uh, in uh, Greek, I think, maybe Latin, who, who knows, <laughs> one of those. Uh, but you can see very gray in color, whereas our black walnut has a very kind of dark chocolatey brown sort of color. Um, also, you'll notice that the ridges, and so um, as this tree has grown out in diameter, um, every tree, well, almost every tree, as they grow out in diameter, you start to get texture in the bark. Um, that's just a, a feature of geometry. Um, the circumference of the tree cannot grow as fast as the area of a tree as it's growing out. And so the circumference has to kind of crack and have fissures and wrinkles and all sorts of textures. Every tree species does a little bit different and every tree species is, uh, has bark that reflects their natural history. So some species that are very adapted to periodic fire moving through will have super thick bark. Um, other species will have really thin bark if they are adapted for understory conditions so that they can actually photosynthesize through their bark. So yeah, there's all sorts of variation and it all is for a reason. Uh, it depends on, you know, the ecology of each species. But let's forget about the ecology of this bark for a second. I'm not really sure, you know, why it is this way, um, but the form of it is very distinctive. So these, uh, as it's grown out and we've started to get this texture, here on walnuts, we get these vertical cracks uh, where we're getting ridges uh, and then we're getting furrows in between them. And the ridges on uh, white walnut or butternut are flattened, which is pretty distinctive. Um, and so this is what catches my eye when I'm walking around and I see this. Um, and again, it's, it's pretty rare that I see this in the woods, but is that flat bark. Um, so we can look, uh, well, a lot of the leaves are pretty high up. So we'll look at these kind of ratty ones from this little sprout here. So it looks a lot like a walnut. Um, it has a pretty similar number of leaflets. I have noticed that the, the leaves get a little kind of thicker. On the, on the white walnut. We might be able to find some later, um, but something that is very operative to mention right now is that this is an example of what we call a compound leaf. So this is not a leaf right here. This is one leaflet. This whole thing is a leaf. So how you can tell the difference between a leaf and a leaflet, every leaf has an, a bud associated with it. So if we look right here at this crook, uh, we call that the axle uh, between the leaf uh, stem, which we would call the rachis and just the stem um, of this branch, we have a tiny little bud sitting there. I mean, this one's pretty beat up. It's all kind of chewed up from bugs. So I'm gonna just do it you know, for educational purposes. If you look in there, you see a little tiny little bit of a bud. Um, and so that indicates that we have a leaf associated there. If we pull apart one of these little leaflets, and I don't know if we could you know, even really zoom in that far, but there is no bud right there. So that tells us that this was a leaflet, not a leaf. And we have what's called a compound leaf where we have multiple leaflets per leaf. We'll look at many examples of simple leaves that just, you know, one leaf per bud. Um, but just like walnut, we have these compound leaves. Um, we do have fruit that I saw earlier. They might be pretty high up and hard for us to get. Um, uh, but they are a little bit more football shaped um, than black walnut at maturity. So um, supposedly they are pretty good. Uh, one of the reasons why this is so rare is it's not, it wasn't inherently a rare species, but um, there is a fungus, I believe, that affects uh, a canker that affects this species pretty heavily. So it's just not very common anymore. It's just been kind of wiped out um, by this fungus um, across a lot of its range. So that's unfortunate because it's pretty good, just like walnut, like black walnut, pretty good quality wood. Um, uh, it doesn't grow as big as black walnut. So that does impact, you know, the commercial, you know, viability of it uh, because yeah, you're not gonna have as much wood, you know, per tree as a black walnut, but there you go. Uh, our first one of the day, our first species probably took me 10 plus minutes to just talk about one species, but that is what I do. Uh, do we have, before we move on to the next tree, do we have any questions or anything? No, great, awesome. I must've covered it all. Uh, okay, so let's move on here. Um, a couple different, so we're gonna look at a couple different walnuts today. 
I also want us to look at a couple different rose species today. Um, so here we have uh, a rose. I think most people can pretty much identify just generally roses because of their, you know, ubiquity in gardens, things like that. Um, they also have compound leaves. How about it? So this is actually multiflora rose. This is one of the most notorious invasive species that we have uh, in the east. Um, it was introduced by the USDA for quick soil stabilization and wildlife cover. Whoops, shouldn't have done that. Uh, turns out, you know, the science of ecology, you know, maybe should have been developed 100 years or so earlier than it was. Uh, but, you know, here we are. Uh, it's a pretty new science. We kind of learn to like, oh, maybe we should think about the relationships between plants and animals when we're choosing plants or managing animals. Uh, we didn't really used to do that at all. We just used to think, eh, wildlife likes cover. Let's plant this because it grows really fast. And it took over, and now it is an incredibly damaging invasive plant. Um, millions and millions and millions of dollars every year go into just trying to remove this plant um, by private landowners, by government agencies, etc. So identification. Again, it does look like a rose. We have these uh, pretty uh, distinctive, you know, prickles here that are recurved, you know, like a like a barb uh, curving back. So those are perfect for getting into your skin or pants and tearing. Uh, I actually even have some scars from this uh, uh, plant on me, but you know, uh, not appropriate for the zoom. Uh, their location. Um, so let's look here at this compound leaf. Um, what I like to, so these here are called stipules. So this is a specialized leaf tissue at the very base of this leaf. Um, what I, how I describe these is rabbit ears from hell. I don't know how easy you can see it, but there's these kind of little fringe sort of bunny ears that come up. And we will look at another rose species in a little bit that's native that doesn't have that. So that's why I'm showing that off. Um, real quick aside about these prickles. They are technically, botanically speaking, they are prickles, not thorns. Um, thorns are modified stem tissue. Um, needles are modified leaf tissue. So like a cactus has needles. Um, and prickles are modified epidermal tissue. So if you want to be super annoying at a party, you can say, uh, no, every rose doesn't have its thorns. It has prickles, technically speaking. Um, uh, and tell them I sent you. Um, so multiflora rose, it's called multiflora rose because there are many flowers per stem. Multiflora, multiflower. I've actually heard old timers call it multiflower rose. Um, don't know if that was, you know, a mistake or if that's what we used to kind of call it back then. Uh, multiflora rose blooms a little earlier in the summer, kind of usually, uh, probably sort of late May, early June, somewhere in there. And the rose species we're going to look at, the native rose species, is blooming right now, and I'm very excited about it. I actually, when I was walking over to this, saw one. Uh, you probably can't see it across the creek over there. There's a big sycamore tree, kind of leaning. And I don't know if you can see these very delicate little pink flowers over there, but that is our native swamp rose. Yeah, you probably can't see it, but that's okay. We'll look at one a little bit closer. Um, although, yeah, Adam will have to walk into the wetland a little bit <laughs> in shorts, but it's okay. It'll be worth it to see this really cool species. Okay, so multiflora rose. Um, let's just keep moving down the line here. Um, so I actually don't have a species identification for this. Um, this is one of the gaps in my knowledge because I don't see this species out, this genus out in the wild too much. Um, and I went to a uh, forestry school in the South, uh, North Carolina State University, go Wolfpack. Um, and uh, you know, when you move out of that region where you learned all your botany and everything, then you have to kind of catch up. Um, we only had one buckeye species down there, painted buckeye, uh, Esculus sylvatica. I think this might be red buckeye, but don't want to misidentify it. So we will just call it Esculus uh, buckeye. Um, now, buckeye is a really cool plant because it has both compound leaves um, where we have see one bud right here and then one leaf, um, but this is held differently. So this is what we call a uh, 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 palmate formation. So just like the palm of your hand where we have one central point and all of the leaflets are arrayed out from there. Um, so this is different than what we had back there on that uh, white walnut, that butternut, which is, uh, or even the multiflora rose. I really don't mind pulling off leaves of the multiflora rose, um, but this is called pinnate. Well, I probably didn't put here we go. Um, meaning feather-like. Um, so you can see kind of like a feather, we have a main stem and then the leaflets array off of it. And then, you know, boom, uh, we have this compound leaflets are coming off of, uh, of that main point right there. Um, also, uh, buckeye is one of the species that is opposite. So. We can see beyond looking at those buds for telling, you know, what is a leaf and what is a compound leaf. Um, the node of growth where the buds are found can tell us some other things too. 
Um, so we have two leaves coming out of one node, uh, which means that we have an opposite uh, uh, arrangement pattern. Um, and so you can see why it's called opposite because they're generally held completely opposite of each other. Um, there is an, uh, so then the, the you know, alternative to that would be alternate um, uh, arrangement. So if you can imagine, you know, the next bud being right here and not the things, the uh, leaves not coming out, you know, opposite of each other, but alternate of each other. That is the most common way that leaves are arranged. So when we see things that are opposite, um, and we can tell that even when the leaves are off, we could see these buds right there and we could know, and we could see the leaf scars in the winter and know that this is opposite. So that narrows it down for us when we're trying to figure out the identification uh, of that tree. Um, so we know there's only a few things that have this um, opposite pattern. And if we have the leaves, I mean, this is a dead giveaway. This is a very much a Buckeye looking, you know, leaf. I think a lot of people recognize it because of uh, Ohio State. Um, the Ohio Buckeye is a, 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 bit, a little bit bigger uh, tree species that's kind of more common in sort of like Great Lakes sort of region. Um, but uh, yeah, we have a couple of sort of smaller species here, smaller kind of small tree, uh, large shrub species here, which again, I think this is red, um, red buckeye. So there we go. We have a cool buckeye leaf. Again, this is a super cool area. I don't see this. I like never, ever, ever see this in the woods. Sometimes I see it for like ornamental plantings and stuff like that, but it's just so cool here. Um, and I think you could probably see the creek behind us here. Um, this is Libes Creek um, in Southern York County in the Muddy Run watershed. Um, but so all the species that we've you know, looked at so far, very adapted to these bottomland conditions. Obviously everything here that we're gonna look at today is, um, but something that I think is kind of important to think about you know, when we're thinking about what species we're finding where is that it's not necessarily that uh, an upland species wouldn't be able to survive here. If say we planted something that maybe shouldn't, really wouldn't normally be found in a bottomland area. If we planted it in this reforestation area, it would probably do just fine. Um, because it, as long as the soil is you know, dry enough for its conditions, whatever, it's not gonna kill it. But what we are seeing out on the landscape is not necessarily an indicator of what can survive there, um, but what can thrive there long-term, what can reproduce there, um, and uh, yeah, what can, what can establish there and stay established there. So we have these kind of different sort of ways of thinking about species. We have pioneer species, which are gonna come into recently disturbed areas and start to grow very rapidly. And then we have more kind of slow growers. Uh, so, you know, like our oaks and things like that, that'll come into areas that are already starting to turn into a forest um, and that will live there. So one of the things we like to think about when we're looking at a landscape is time and what degree of disturbance we've likely been having here over time, judging on, judging by the species that we have uh, that we're seeing in front of us and the regeneration of species that we're seeing. So and a big factor uh, involved with the regeneration is gonna be how much deer browse we have. Um, so unfortunately, in a lot of our landscapes, we don't have a lot of stuff in the understory except invasive plants like multiflora rose because that is what deer are not consuming. Uh, they are consuming native tissue, native material, but they generally don't bother multiflora rose or burning bush or autumn olive or any of the other invaders that we see. But here, I am guessing we have a pretty decent, you know, the deer population is, is, is decently controlled because we have so much cool stuff in the understory um, and so many cool things in the overstory. So we're gonna take a little bit of a walk um, to go see some other species. We're gonna try to stay in the shade to keep the cool, the phone nice and cool. Um, do we have any questions while we're walking and talking? No, darn, this would be a good opportunity. So, uh, well, real quick, as we're going, um, a lot of folks probably recognize this little guy. Um, so this is jewelweed in Patience capensis. This is an annual native uh, herbaceous plant. We call those forbs. Um, we have them all down here. So I, I have a feeling everybody on this call is probably kind of a stream enthusiast of some stripe or another. You're probably very well acquainted with this plant. Um, it is known to neutralize the, the toxins in um, poison ivy. So if you touch some poison ivy, I've been doing this for years and it's pretty effective. I mean, obviously washing with soap and water is like the number one, but what I like to do if, I, if I'm working in the field, I'm not gonna be inside for hours and hours after that. Uh, and I know I've touched poison ivy is I'll try to wash off in a creek or something. And then I will crush up the, um, the impatience, uh, the, the drool weed and rub it all the kind of juice, you know, onto the poison ivy where I contact the poison ivy. And usually it works pretty nice. It might be the stream washing it away, you know, but. Uh, I, I've noted that it does do pretty well. We'll see if I can, well, we won't bother. The reason why it's called jewelweed, this is a homework for you. This is a little fun thing for you to do at home. Take one of those leaves, 
and um, and it's, it shimmers. Uh, there's little air bubbles. I think there's some sort of waxy coating on the leaves. Um, and so it kind of shimmers in the water. That's why it's called Julied. Um, a little, uh, I think she was like maybe, you know, second grade or something, uh, showed me that uh, a couple of years ago at a, at a uh, workshop. So that was kind of fun to learn something from a kid. Um, so do we have a question? Yeah. How long do we keep the trees in the tree tubes mm -hmm. and um, to protect against deer? And do they eat, you know, when they grow off the top of the tree tubes? Mm -hmm. Do the deer eat them? Yeah, good questions. Good question. So these are imperfect solutions to this issue of deer browse. Um, if we were to not remove this deer shelter at all, um, we do have perforations in it. It would start to split and open itself off, but we actually like to take a little bit closer care of our buffers than kind of the bare minimum. Um, because you'll start to get damage, you'll start to get bark abrasion. So we usually remove them when my kind of rule of thumb is when you can't fit both your thumbs in there anymore, you know, with the tree. So when you have about an inch of wiggle room left at the top of the shelter, generally that means that you have zero room left at the bottom of the shelter. And you can go ahead and cut it off. Sometimes you will get deer rubbing, you know, bucks rubbing on the trees and killing them or damaging them that way. But one of the reasons why we plant a little bit higher than the bare minimum up here in PA, our bare minimum for reforestation is 200 trees per acre. We like to plant 275 just to kind of keep those numbers a little bit higher. We will have deer browse on the trees, you know, once they get a little bit taller, but generally that's not, um, they're not gonna permanently damage the trees that way um, when they're browsing on it. So once they escape here and they get big enough to survive buck rub, then they're pretty much good to go, which is great. And then we can start to cease the mowing under here. You know, we're trying to turn this into forest and you might be wondering like, we're trying to turn it into forest. Why, you know, why is land under mowing? Why do we have these rings around each tree? These are just measures to re reduce our vole cover so that we don't have as much uh, herbivory on our trees so that not as many trees get e eaten up by the voles. If there's very little cover for them out here, they will, they will be very happy to be in the jewelweed and the reed canary grass and the brushy areas and that's just where they'll live. If this was all kind of overgrown, brushy, there would be literally hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of voles in here just waiting for an opportunity to get in there and girdle our trees, eat up the tree roots. Um, and so in addition to keeping it pretty well mowed, and sometimes what we like to do is instead of mowing the entire site so that we can have some good biodiversity in the site as well, we'll just mow alleys, just strips along each side of the trees um, so that you'll have a nice space in the middle of the trees where we do still have habitat for all the pollinators and the bunnies and everything like that. Um, but then these rings of herbicide around each tree, when we have a property that's not organic, additionally helps because voles really, really, they don't really like short grass. They really don't like being out in the open. This is a perfect opportunity for them to get eaten by a hawk or an owl or whatever, cat, who knows? So they will not go out in the open. This is just a behavioral way that we reduce the, the pressure on our trees. So, um, mm -hmm. a variety of trees here in the buffer. Yeah, we planted about 20, 25 species, which is kind of usually what we uh, go for. So um, the species that I remember that we planted mostly are the ones that I've seen sticking out of the top of the shelters today, but uh, silver maple, sycamore is doing really well. We did plant some red maple in here as well. We planted swamp white oak, we planted pin oak, uh, uh, tons of shrub species as well. Um, spice bush is a really good one because once it gets established, it is pretty tolerant of, of deer. They don't really bother it too much, um, all sorts of stuff. So we really focused on pollinator friendly species here because that was one of the objectives of the landowner. But we usually do that pretty much anywhere. We just pack it full of nectar producing, pollen producing species so that we're, while we're, you know, restoring this area to be a forest to restore the stream, we're also providing, you know, for the pollinators too. Just a couple little choices that we make and make it better for, you know, multiple things while we're at it. Um, so hopefully that answers that. Um, okay. As we're walking, Ryan, we yeah. have a question from Annapolis. Oh. Um, the leaves at the tip of our oak trees look dead, but the rest of the tree seems unimpacted. Can you speak to what might be happening? Is it potentially cicadas? Yeah, that was what I was thinking because I've noticed that too. We actually didn't get a huge outbreak in Lancaster, but I've been in other parts of PA where they have had decent outbreaks. And yeah, you see that kind of flag. So we're the very tips of the leaves. So let's say, you know, here, this red maple jump. Uh, so basically I'm imagining what you're describing is say right here, it's kind of broken. And then this is all brown. So I would actually, if you take a look at the stem, you can see where the cicada damage is, um, the slit that the female has made and the little holes where she has laid, deposited her eggs in there. And I've actually heard, I haven't tried to do this, but maybe if you're there where you've had literally billions of cicadas, you can try this out. I didn't want to do it up here because we didn't have that many. But I've heard that you can take that off and kind of shake out 
the eggs um, to look at them. So that might be kind of cool. Oh, I shouldn't have let that go. Um, so that is what I anticipate that might be. Although a lot of our oaks are not really doing that well right now. Um, you know, whew, that's high for a, a little guy like me to jump up to. Uh, uh, but um, yeah, a lot of our oaks, especially in urbanized areas, we're not doing very well right now. So it might be, there's kind of a cocktail of factors that could be, uh, you know, affecting those trees. Um, but yeah, in more urbanized areas there, especially white oaks, I've heard are kind of just starting to die. Um, when we kind of think about climate change and how species move around and how things change, a lot of it uh, with, with tree species is less one independent factor and more a bunch of factors combined. So all, all this humidity might be increasing, you know, fungal diseases in say the oak genus. Then all the heat is causing water stress. Then, you know, it's really cold at different times of year and warm it in. So like all these different factors and the pests and the native bugs and everything combined, they can start to kind of, you know, just be the straw that broke the camel's back. So hopefully your tree doesn't die. Hopefully it is just that one stem, but I've been hearing from kind of arboriculture friends in kind of the sort of the, uh, the DMV, if you will, that they're starting to see mature trees just kind of dying. So pretty scary. Um, so anyway, let's talk about nice stuff. So, um, so this year's red maple, uh, great species to learn because this is the most common tree species in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Number one right here, red maple. That is because it is super, super, super broadly tolerant. It grows really fast and um, it does this interesting thing uh, called mesification. And so it's kind of part of what I teased a little bit earlier about what we're seeing on the landscape is kind of a factor of time and of all the interactions of the species that we're seeing. Um, so first let's talk about the identification, the natural history and all that stuff, you know, of the red maple. So this is another one of those opposite species. So we can see here uh, at the very tip, um, you know, we have these leaves are held opposite of each other. We also have simple leaves where we don't have clearly a compound leaf at all. That's the little leaf right there. Now uh, there's a bunch of different maple species we have. Um, red maple is the one that has these th only three lobes. Sometimes it'll get little tiny lobes down here, but three main robes, lobes. So if you want to remember that, red, R-E-D, red maple. There we go. Um, also, red maple has something red on it pretty much all year round. Oops, lost that leaf. So you can see the, uh, the petiole here, which is the stem of the leaf tissue, is reddish. Um, the samaras, which are the fruit, you know, those little helicopters, those whirly gigs, those kind of have a reddish tint on them. Obviously, the foliage uh, is red. Um, in the autumn and then in the spring, the flowers are red. So there you go, red maple, it's red maple for a reason. So uh, beyond the fact that it has these three lobes kind of looks, you know, people have said like a cat face, you know, in, in kind of profile here where, you know, we have the little ears and then I guess sort of the, you know, the head by, it, yeah, it, everyone knows what a maple leaf looks like, right? So this is the one that only has the three lobes. Um, let's see what else we can see on this guy. I do not see any Samaras right now, um, but let's take a peek at the bark. So you won't be able to see this, but red maple uh, at the very tops of the trees, just like everything, is very, very smooth. Um, uh, but you can, as you kind of look down, you can kind of see the different bark structures that it will have at different ages. Um, red maple to me is one of the more confusing ones uh, to identify by bark because it has so much variation in the bark. You are very rarely going to see two red maples that look exactly the same, even if they're the same size. There's just a lot of variation. Um, uh, but generally speaking, we do still have these vertical cracks um, that are less kind of ridges and furrows and more sort of cracks where we have these sort of sheets that kind of uh, come off. Red maple is very brittle. So if you, you know, find one of these, um, if you, well, yeah, you'll be able to tell it by the leaves, but let's say it's the winter time um, where I actually run into this, and I'll just leave it in there, um, is when we're tapping sugar maples in my in-laws place, um, telling the difference between a red maple and a sugar maple in the winter is pretty hard, but you're tapping maples in, you know, February. And so we need to know what it is in February. Um, if you were to push on the bark like that of a, of a sugar maple, it would be super rigid, but the red maple is super easy. I, I promise I'm not just like don't have superhuman strength. It just is very brittle and will snap really easily. Um, so, so red maple, why is it the most common species, you know, um, in the watershed? It really has to do with our forest management and that mesification term that I mentioned earlier. So here in the mid-Atlantic, um, historically speaking, there was a lot of fire that was, you know, set naturally. Uh, they think that a couple thousand years ago, there were way more storms that caused lightning strikes and, and a little bit of kind of weather-related disturbance events. 
uh, but also Native Americans were burning very frequently. Uh, they were managing habitat. Um, they were managing to reduce tick populations. They were increasing populations of game species. Um, I think a lot of folks know, you know, Elk Neck, uh, kind of northern part of the bay, there were elk here, you know, historically speaking. Um, and so our habitats looked a lot different than they do now. They were not these kind of like middle-aged, you know, forests, we think, they were generally speaking more open forests because they were being burned frequently. So we had this understory of a lot of saplings, shrubs, herbaceous species that every you know five to 10 years was getting burned. And so a lot of those young species cannot tolerate the fires and they would die. And we would have some mature species that were, or some mature trees that were, you know, somehow lucked out were, was, were able to escape, escape the fire and then developed bark that was, you know, thick enough to be able to um, survive that periodic fire. At that point in time, red maple was actually not very common. Um, it is called a bunch of different things. Swamp maple is one of them because this was actually pretty much its main habitat back in the day. It's sitting right on the edge of a tiny little stream right here. We just looked at some you know, species that love uh, uh, wet conditions. We're gonna look at some that really, really love wet conditions in a little bit. Um, and so this is kind of a wet loving uh, tree. Um, that thin bark does not withstand periodic fire. So an adaptation that red maple has that has allowed it to become the most common species now that we don't really burn anymore. And when we do have a wildfire, we snuff it out immediately because we have farms and we have houses and we have all sorts of stuff mixed into the woods. We can't just let our bur woods burn anymore like we used to. At least that's what we think. If we maybe manage it a little bit better, maybe we could. That's all I'll say about that. Um, but what red maple does, and this is just fascinating to me um, because the landowner is doing an excellent job managing this and mowing it, can't really see leaf accumulation on the ground, but um, if you are walking in the woods in the autumn and you're crunching on leaves on the forest floor, you're not stepping on red maple. You're stepping on oaks probably, maybe hickories, maybe some other species. Pay attention in the forest floor, especially when you find you know, a maple. Um, they will all be laying very, very flat and they hold moisture really, really well. If you brush away some leaf litter that's all maples, it's gonna be pretty damp, even if it hasn't rained in quite a while. Whereas the oaks, it'll be a lot drier because they have so much texture, right? They're very 3D. That's why they're more fun to crunch on when you're walking in the woods. These are just flat. So these don't carry, these leaves don't carry fire in the same way that oaks do. And oaks are adapted to carry fire. They want to carry that fire because their acorns can germinate way better in conditions where we've had a fire come through. Um, they need a good bit of light. We call those shade intolerant. So they will grow for a while and they'll survive for decades in the understory that's pretty shaded, but they can't really become full mature trees. They can't grow very well unless they have a decent amount of light. Red maple is what we call shade tolerant. It doesn't really care about shade. It'll grow a little bit slower in the shade for sure, but it'll grow happily in the shade. And its strategy is to move in and tolerate the shade. And then eventually, put up so much shade itself that it is suppressing the other stuff around it. And one of the ways, again, it does that is by uh, reducing the amount of fire that can be carried by its own leaves. I just think this is fascinating that just the physical structure of the leaves has, is part of the you know, evolution of the species, the adaptation of the species. So super, super interesting. Now again, like, okay, why, why does this matter? Why does like, why would you want wildfire, all this stuff? So again, we, for oaks, for hickories, for a lot of other species that are super important to our ecosystems, and we can even think like longleaf pine in Virginia was incredibly fire dependent. That was more of like a one to three year period of burning. Um, um, so when we don't have fires anymore, when we're not clearing out the kind of intermediate, you know, competition, the smaller trees and shrubs and, and some of these red, uh, red maple seedlings coming in, then we're going to start losing oak regeneration. Not immediately, but there's just going to be less every year every year, every year, eventually you need regeneration or you're not gonna have adults, especially for things like oaks that take 70 years till they can start to produce acorns themselves. So we are actually kind of on the verge of a complete sort of crisis in our forest right now. And it's due to a lack of management, a lack of sustainable management, not just managing, meaning cutting down some trees um, or just you know attacking those invasive plants, but kind of everything, managing the woods completely to try to restore some of these historical disturbance conditions that a lot of species really rely on. Not just the trees, but a lot of bird species need that you know, early successional habitat, elk, you know, for instance, uh, uh, rough grouse, tons of stuff need those early successional habitats. Right now where we're at is we either have things that are not forest, like a farm or a neighborhood or whatever, or a forest that's about 
80 years old because pretty much everything was cleared in kind of the sort of early 1900s. So if our entire forested landscape is like maybe 80 to 120 years old, we don't have as much diversity as we really having to build resilient ecosystems. Okay, so gotcha. Okay, well, we got to go look at some cool stuff then. Um, yeah, yeah, I can kind of, we were joking about it, like, okay, how many trees are we going to look at today? We probably could have just stood still at one tree and I could have just talked. So I apologize if it's been, you know, a little boring, um, but this is kind of, you know, this is what I do. I get way too excited. So let's take a peek at our black walnut since we looked at our white walnut this morning. So Juglans nigra is our black walnut. Um, super common species, not as common as, you know, red maple, but super common, really loves these, uh, these bottomland soils. Um, it grows a lot bigger and it has a much bigger crown. Um, it's kind of renowned for being a large crowned species. Um, so if you recall, our butternut had very flattened uh, ridges. This, this has this kind of normal ridges. They intersect in kind of X, Y sort of pattern um, that are pretty long but to, before they have their intersection. And so that is another good kind of identifying trait. Um, things like, you know, tulip poplar will also have this XY pattern. Uh, a bunch of hickories will have this XY pattern. Um, but with black walnut in particular, it has this kind of dark bark, but if you peel a little bit of that bark away, that is like super black walnut, you know, kind of chocolate brown color. Um, so yeah, black walnut, uh, Juglans nigra, um, obviously really important timber species. This is like kind of one of the top ones right now consistently uh, for timber. Um, uh, which is important, even if you're not into, you know, uh, timbering, again, it's an important part of forest management. So if we're doing it scientifically, it's actually incredibly important for the ecosystem resilience there. Um, but if we want people to have forest cover and not just turn it into a neighborhood, we need it to be valuable to them. And so we need to actually promote, you know, sustainable forestry. Um, and so black walnut is a great species because it does provide a lot of economic value to a lot of landowners. You can think of gun stocks and cabinets and all sorts of stuff and all, you know, black walnut, really high quality wood. You got a question? Um, someone asked, they find black walnuts are not a preferred food. The acorns go first. Is that correct? Yeah, they definitely. So uh, English walnut is the species that we, you know, use for food for walnuts. Um, black walnut, yeah, they, they're so hard to get the nuts out of there. Um, it's really hard to crack them, to process them. Um, they do rot pretty quickly. You know, they get, they get all black and stuff like that. It's kind of more of a wildlife food. I do know people who do, uh, you know, use them for, for, you know, human food. It just takes a little bit of special processing. Also, you can make dyes out of the husks um, and uh, you can tack these bad boys for syrup. So that's another way that, you know, they can be an edible species. Um, and I mentioned that I, I do tap, you know, uh, sugar maples with my father-in-law up in Wyoming County, PA. Um, if you actually want to see more like actual tree talks, so it's the name of a little kind of YouTube series that we do as part of our outreach efforts, our Forest for the Bay, you know, outreach efforts. Um, but back uh, a couple of years ago, it was right before COVID, I think, we, we did a whole how to, you know, backyard sugar uh, tapping so you can look into that there but the cool thing about black walnut sycamore birches a lot of alternative sap sources for syrup is that they're not running at the same time of year as the maple sap is so you can kind of diversify you can take those taps i've actually read we haven't tried the, the sweet birch yet black birch um but i've read that the timing is perfect so that when you take them out of the sugar maples you can walk over to the next tree and stick them into that sweet birch so we're going to try it someday i've heard that black walnut's interesting flavor usually when people say a flavor is interesting you know, it might not be great, but it's interesting. So I'd like to try it someday. Um, before we run out of time, let's look at this super, super cool wetland species and make sure Adam gets all scraped up uh, uh, from the knee down. Um, so first, and a super common one that we see all over the place. One of my very favorite trees here uh, is uh, black willow. Um, so it has these slender leaves um, that are lanceolate in form. So uh, we don't have many species that look like this, like a like a willow in the same way. Here, yeah, we'll jump up and we'll get a good branch for you, huh? Well, here we go. There's a good branch for you. Um, uh, so yeah, they actually, they do have pretty brittle branches. Um, a lot of folks, you know, say that quote messy trees because they will lose branches, you know, pretty readily. That is an adaptation to the conditions that they have evolved to. They are a wetland species, uh, which means that they live in a world of pure disturbance. They are having constant floods. They're constantly getting chewed down by beavers. Um, there's constant, there's more disease here. You know, things are wetter, all these things uh, combine so that 
species that are adapted to wetlands have to be really, really, really tough. And they have to be good at losing limbs. And they have to be good at that periodic disturbance. So let's say we come in here with a chainsaw and cut this down and just leave it laying right here. It'll grow a new tree from that stump. Uh, it'll send out new roots and then it'll just send out a new tree. And so you can see these in wetland areas oftentimes. There's a really big log on the ground where a, a black walnut fell over like, you know, 50 years ago or whatever. And then you'll see a perfectly straight tree growing right out of it. So this is a really great one. We do, we plant tons and tons and tons of this really fast grower. It's also one of the most important species for insect browse. Uh, is is willows in, more generally, but black willow is one of our most common willows here um, in the mid-Atlantic. Um, we also live stake a ton with this species. That's where, because of this tolerance to disturbance, if in the dormant season, we took a cutting off this branch, pounded it into the mud, odds are a new willow would grow there. So it's a really cheap, quick, effective way to just keep spreading plants around a site. Okay, so real quick. Uh, two species that I absolutely wanted to see today, um, and you can, you can you maybe tell, you maybe hear us squishing around. Um, I'll go behind it here, Adam. So this is a super common, commonly planted species in rain gardens, stuff like that, because it's just so cool and just so pretty. Like these are super, super interesting flowers to me. Um, oh, sorry, this is button bush, uh, Cephalanthus occidentalis. Um, uh, so this is one that we plant a lot of. It's a pretty fast growing little shrub, loves, loves, loves wet feet, loves wet areas. Um, obviously super good um, for pollinators. I actually saw a swallowtail butterfly here when we were kind of scouting out this morning. Um, but also these will develop into these kind of nutty little seeds that are supposedly really important for uh, wood duck. Uh, it's like one of the most important wood duck foods um, and where there's a little bit you know, more robust wood duck population. But it doesn't grow super tall. There's some on this site that are kind of the biggest ones I've ever seen, but pretty far away. We don't have to walk down there, um, but it just has this glorious little flower. I just love, love, love button bush. Um, so another thing, speaking of ducks that I wanted to point out, this crazy guy here is called duck potato. Uh, this is a native, it's not a tree, sorry. Uh, getting too excited about herbaceous species here. Um, but uh, it's also uh, yeah, arrow, arrow leaf or narrow, narrow arrow leaf, I think uh, is, is another name for it. I do not recall the scientific name, sorry everyone. Um, but yeah, duck potato. So this is another important um, uh, duck food and an indicator that we have very, very wet soils really only grows in actual wetlands. Speaking of, we have tons of wetland plants here. We have sensitive fern. We have our lovely stinky skunk cabbage, um, which, you know, the leaves are starting to senesce now. Um, famously skunk cabbage, well, stinks, but also it is the, one of the first flowers that open up for us. And uh, our skunk cabbage actually has a property where it will melt snow. Um, it will melt snow so that it, it can be pollinated, which is pretty cool. Uh, thermogenic is what we call those plants. Um, so then I think we're getting close to time. So I wanted to look at the, at the swamp rose finally. Teased it for so long, we can't go, you know, this session without looking at it. Um, all right, I can, uh, I'll bring this up. Uh, oh, okay. All right, how about it? Oh, cool. Okay, so real quick, before we look at that, can you see all this silly string looking stuff in here? Um, so this is actually, a plant. This is its whole bot. This is what it looks like. This is called dodder, D-O-D-D-E-R. Yeah, it looks like kind of weed whacker, you know, string or like, yeah, just silly string or something. So this is a parasitic plant. It's not green because it has no photosynthetic potential. Um, and you see it a lot in kind of wetter areas. I don't know if it's kind of an obligate of wetland situations, but it seems to really love to prey on uh, a couple of wetland species in particular, jewelweed, um, and this is uh, another, this is Persicaria uh, arrowleaf tear thumb, another really cool wetland plant. Um, that'll get you too. So yeah, the name is, uh, is real. It will tear your thumb right out. Oh, cool. So I'm seeing, uh, I just saw a bumblebee on the swamp rose flower. Oh boy, it's wet. Should have brought mushrooms today. Okay, it'll be worth it. So, oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, we have here Rosa palustris swamp rose. So we talked about multiflora rose, super gnarly, invasive plant, no good, spreads everywhere, causes a lot of damage. We can look at these leaves and they look very different. So they have, they're also compound and they kind of look, you know, similar, but 
they don't have those fringe stipules. They have very blocky stipules. I don't know how closely you can see that. Um, but yeah, they don't look like those kind of sticky bunny rabbit, you know, ears uh, from hell per se. Uh, they're just little, little squared stipules. Um, also, the native rose, you can see, I think Adam got a pretty good shot of it. It has this really beautiful, delicate little pink flower that doesn't really persist for very long. It's kind of short, you know, uh, it's only around for a, a, a short time. Um, so that kind of makes it even more special to me. Um, and we can see the fruits here are a lot bigger. So these fruits are only maybe halfway grown as far as uh, their full size and they're way bigger than multiflora rose will be at full maturity. These hips or akines are actually way bigger um, in the swamp rose. Um, okay, finally, one last thing. You can see you don't really have those huge, stout, nasty, let's take a little bit of a branch here, those nasty prickles on here. We do have two barbed prickles that are a little bit thicker, but they are just at kind of nodes. You can see there. So the whole stem isn't completely covered with these. They're a lot smaller and slighter um, than the multiflora rose, um, but we do have two that curve down. We have a couple other native rose species that just have very straight needle-like uh, uh, prickles. So that's how you know. Okay, there we go. So we're pretty close to time. Does anyone have any other questions or anything while we're here in the, uh, in the wetland? It's very humid. It's even more humid in here, I think. <laughs> Yeah, we don't have any more right now. Cool. Awesome. Great. Well, uh, yeah, we got five more minutes. I, I don't know. What do you think? Do you wanna... for a reason it can withstand pretty wet conditions i actually see red maple in actual like wet or on kind of floodplain forests where they're getting periodic heavy water um but not um do you advise um yeah yeah uh, I, I advise planting them kind of everywhere because imagine them doing really sort of managing their own habitat you know we are we are and stuff like that but the shrubs are really giving a lot back to the wildlife um a lot of them are you know shrubs are insect pollinated for kind of wildlife friendly flowers a lot of them will predating things like that it's also really valuable cover if you think about the the woods in the winter time and a deciduous forest you're not going to really see much, you know, on the understory if it's all trees. So there's nowhere for animals to go, for larger wildlife to go, like deer, you know, to hold up over the winter. So if we can plant a lot of uh, shrubs, especially in these areas where wetland shrubs grow really, really well, and they can start to form these thickets, then we have fantastic habitat in the wintertime for escaping from predators, for thermal cover, all sorts of stuff like that. So yeah, really, really valuable. Is buttonbush easy to get established even in partial shade? Hmm. Trying to think, I feel like I see it in partial shade a, a pretty good bit. You know, even here, like it, it's kind of in partial shade of that red maple over there. So I'm not exactly sure about that, um, but I would say give it a try. Yeah. Can you spell the word that you use to describe red maple's fire suppression strategy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mesification. So M E S. I don't know. I might need a piece of paper. I need a crayon to spell it out. Okay. Mesification. So M E S I P H. I C A T I O N. I did not just win the script spelling bee. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's probably, I have a really hard time. I have to like write words down to like be able to spell them. Um, but basically, music means middle, you know, not dry, not wet, kind of right in the middle, and then, you know, ification. So it is turning a forest from a xeric system, a dry system, into more of a music system. So that's where that mesification comes from. Gotcha. So yeah, Google it. Have Kate pasted it here in the chats. M-E-S-O-P-H-I-C-A-T-I-O-N. I said an O instead of an I. <laughs> oh man. Don't tell uh, Craig, my <laughs> supervisor. <laughs> Those are all the questions we have right now. Any more questions? Well, appreciate it everyone. If you, uh, so what we usually do in a normal tree talk is I just 
uh, my wife and I are taking a hike in the woods on the weekend or whatever, and I see something cool and we just stop and I just talk about it. So I talk about the identification, the natural history. It does not go on so long. We usually try to keep on more like five minutes, six minutes kind of thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you just look up forest for the Bay on YouTube, it's a slightly different channel than the Alliance's channel because that forest for the Bay program that is actually meant to be kind of a clearing house for all the forestry agencies in the entire watershed. It's kind of supposed to be like a shared resource where everyone, it's like a hub of, of learning. So we have this kind of separate YouTube channel where we, we have this tree talk posted right now. So yeah, look it up, subscribe and see me about once a month talking yeah, trees. I pasted the link in the chat. So. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Appreciate it. Cool. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for braving the heat and humidity and uh, the prickles, not thorns. That was something you yeah. learned. Uh, today. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and I want to thank all of our attendees for staying on with us. I know we had a couple of challenges with uh, some streaming and all. Um, so thanks for sticking with us. Thanks for joining us for our Breakfast on the Bay series. And once again, I'd like to thank our donors who made today's presentation possible. And in honor of our 50th anniversary, our board and committed donors have raised a $25,000 match. And so if you donate to the Alliance this summer, we will be matching that dollar for dollar to help keep us focused on the most pressing challenges of the Chesapeake Bay watershed for the next 50 years. Um, be sure to check out our other Breakfast on the Bay talks. We've got a lot more coming up this summer with uh, Around the Watershed. So um, please check out our website and join us again. So thanks again for joining us, everybody, and have a wonderful Thursday.